Hello, Mr. Rafael. How are you, my man? Hello, Enrique. Nice to be here with you. I'm good, thank you. How about ah, yourself? great to be here. Great. I'm. I'm fine. I'm really fine. Great. To, great that you have that you are here. And thank you again for accepting the invitation. It's a. Uh, it's literally an honor to talk with you. Your uh, Human Trophic Level was a game changer in my practice and in my teaching too. I'm, I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad I had a positive impact. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let me see. Uh, let's start with your presentation. Tell a little bit about, about yourself. How, how did you begin this interest in anthropology? Tell, uh, tell a little bit. So my interest in anthropology, paleoanthropology, so the study of uh, human diets and what we evolved uh, to eat. Uh, I think my father really loved this topic when I was young. I remember him talking to me about it. And I think I forgot about it for many years through adolescence. And then it reemerged later on when I got interested into, in evolutionary theory, evolution by natural selection, you know, uh, Darwin's uh, theory. And this really fascinated me, and I learned that it was the most powerful idea in biology. And so years later, when I read Gary Taubes' book, Good Calories, Bad Calories, yeah. uh, I became very interested in nutrition. And then so I had these two new interests, evolutionary uh, biology and nutrition. And so I decided that the framework for nutrition should be evolutionary biology. And that's how... Uh, I'm here today, uh, you know, asking people to consider ancestral diets uh, to fix their health is issues. Uh, so that's how I came about it. And I think it's something that's uh, sorely lacking in uh, mainstream medicine. Yeah, yeah. And uh, 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 your original graduation is in what area? So I have a master's in molecular biology. I also mm -hmm. have a, a management studies degree that's totally unrelated. Um, but my master's in molecular biology, and I did four years of a PhD, which I didn't complete during the time of COVID. But during those four years, I did a lot of neuroscience experiments, uh, working with rodents on a rodent model of schizophrenia. So I was uh, mm. using rats to look at the metabolic side effects of antipsychotics that we you know, typically give to patients because they generate a lot of insulin resistance, weight gain. Uh, other issues, and I wanted to study that, and I managed to uh, have an arm of the diet trial, actually, uh, on a ketogenic diet. Uh, so Interesting. I, I got to do some some uh, work in that area, but unfortunately, the res results were never published because uh, at the time, they didn't like publishing negative results, null results. So unfortunately, yeah. what, what we get in the literature is a very biased uh, picture. Yeah. Yeah. And how was the, 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 the contact with uh, Mickey Bendor and the, the writing of that, the, the, the article? Yeah, like most of the good scientific things in my life, they tend to start on Twitter. So I've been exchanging mm -hmm. with Mickey for years and years. I think the first time we met may have been at Low Carb Denver. Uh, sorry, uh, before that, actually, uh, probably in uh, um, Tel Aviv. Uh, in uh, Israel when I went for a conference there for my PhD uh, and then in Tel Aviv where, where he lives uh, and then at Low Carb Denver in 2020 and also at the Metabolics Conference in Tel Aviv a few years later. 
So uh, met him a few times and, and mainly through Twitter, but we decided to collaborate on this question that wasn't really addressed in the, in the literature satisfactorily. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very interesting. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm a fan of your work. I'm a fan of the Mickey Bendor's work. And uh, if, you, if you can tell a little bit to us, uh, how was the, the, the evolution of our food? How was, how was we, we were not always omnivores or carnivores. We begin as uh, uh, vegetarians, like let's say the herbivores. Uh, how was, how was the, the, the pressure, the, the, the natural selection that made us switch from vegetables, from plants, to uh, uh, meat and then became the, the ones that we are today. Yeah, so we can we can think of it in uh, by looking at two species in two different times. So during a uh, time frame called the Pliocene, that's about 5.3 million years ago to 2.58 million years ago. In that uh, time, there was a species called Australopithecus, and it would, it, it, he wouldn't really look human to us. Uh, they were, you know, standing upright, but they would look more like a chimp maybe than a, than a, a human. Um, and, you know, they would eat fruit, vegetables, small insects, lizards, uh, tubers, that sort of diet. So it was really sort of, you know, very high in fiber, not very energy dense, uh, sca uh, scavenging. Um, and also, you know, gathering and, you know, small, very small prey. So this would, in one way of uh, uh, calling that would be a low quality diet, not because it's bad for the species, just because it's not very dense, it's not very caloric, it takes a lot of time, you have to spend a lot of time chewing, eating, you don't have a lot of time for other things. Then they were, the they were this, already, yes, they were, uh, the, sorry, they were already uh, uh, in the, 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 the grounds or they were still in the trees, Australopithecus? They were already on the, on the ground uh, at this point. Yeah. So, because there's a lot of tubers which are underground and, you know, to cover distances, to, to increase the diets, there were already some, you know, bipedal, uh, basically. So yeah, when the um, Pleistocene time came, so that's between 12 point, uh, uh, sorry, 2.5 million years to about 11,200 years ago. So now we're getting much closer uh, to, uh, to nowadays by about 12,000 years. And during that time, there was Homo sapiens, which is our, you know, what we are basically, we're Homo sapiens sapiens. And that we are different from Australopithecus because our diet became very high quality. So most of our diets, I would say about 70% or more of the calories came from animals and not small animals like insects and lizards, but really big uh, animals like mammoths or, you know, uh, hippos, or rhinos, elephants, uh, the sort of animals that have a lot of fat. And when, when you successfully hunt them, there's a huge energetic return compared to eating vegetables, fruits, small, small insects. So, of course, it's very hard to kill a big animal, but it's very good if you can because you get a huge reward. So it's like a big gamble. And humans became apex predators, which means they were at the top of the food chain. And this was largely because of technology, our very intelligent brains that allowed us to develop this technology and figure out how to coordinate and generate hunting tools and techniques so that we can take down huge prey, which have a lot of fat and a, and a lot of nutrients, and, you know, forced us to cook it because not only did we hunt, but then we further concentrated the food and made it further easy to digest and more bioavailable. So we really had this incredible ability to get nutrients and calories, unlike many other species. And this is potentially why our brain and intelligence is so unique amongst uh, animals on Earth. Uh, food probably has a big role to do with this. Uh, there are other reasons than food. But food and fat and calories and animal foods are a big part of it. In this in this transition from uh, plants to to meat to to animals, we uh, we have the 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 some uh, adaptations, some some changes in our physiology and in our morphology. One thing that came, comes to mind is the expensive tissue hypothesis. 
that says that uh, our brain developed and our interesting intestines shrink. So can you tell a little bit about these adaptations? Yeah, so looking at the brain and the gut anatomy is a very good uh, thing to look at because it really helps you understand um, what foods likely came through our guts and our, and our mouths. Because unlike uh, hindguts fermenting animals or herbivores, who basically have to spend many hours a day eating low quality, meaning high fiber, low calorie foods, they use these foods to ferment uh, in their, in their uh, various you know, uh, rumen, for example. And the bacteria basically turn the indigestible cellulose into fat. And this allows them to extract, you know, a lot of energy, but it takes a lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of fermentation. Uh, it's not a very uh, great return on investment, in a sense. It's a, a different strategy. For humans, uh, you know, we went a totally different way. Our guts shrank because we cooked foods and because the foods were very calorie and very nutrient dense. So we didn't need all this added surface area and fermentation chambers to extract uh, energy from low quality foods. And this high uh, calorie, high nutrient density diet really is what you need if you're going to grow a big brain, because the brain, uh, a lot of energy that we expend is just our brain running in the background, you know, doing its day to day operations. Um, mm. It requires a lot of cholesterol, a lot of fatty acids. Um, you know, it's a it's very expensive tissue to build and you can see it in children. I mean, they take so many years to develop to full size and to mature and to become intelligent because the brain requires so much energy and developmental time. And you need a certain gut to do this. And that's why our gut adapted to eat the foods that were going to allow us to achieve this brain building uh, project that we, that we achieved. Yeah. And uh, uh, there are, there are another, another uh, adaptations like, uh, uh, because uh, when, when you talk nowadays, there is a, a, a great uh, a great media saying that we should eat only plants and uh, they the, 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 the people that say that uh, usually do uh, say that uh, our teeth are not able to to cut meat there's no uh, uh, fangs and uh, we have no claws and we have no strength and all the, the, the things that uh, we see, of course, in, in carnivores, in tigers and lions. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, at the same time, we know that, uh, that our ancestors were eating animals. So what, what, what's the difference between a, a, a human carnivore and a natural, let's say, uh, uh, lion, tiger, carnivore. Why should we eat meat? Yeah, so that's a really Im important question. And, you know, whether we, how we classify ourselves really tells us what we think about the diet we should be eating. So typically the mainstream, I would say, consensus view is that humans are omnivores. And there is some truth to that. It's, it's true in the extent that we, we can be healthy on an omnivorous eating pattern with plants and animals. That's, that's correct. However, in terms of formal classification of our species, I would argue that we're hyper carnivores. And I think it's okay. a very good argument for that. The reason the term hyper carnivore sounds extreme in the mind of people, but there's a technical meaning. The technical meaning is 70% or more calories from animals. So, so you can be a hyper carnivore and still have 30% of calories coming from plants, which for many people is not too different from how they eat if you actually look at the, the calorie distribution. At least for many people in the low carb community, even who aren't carnivore, you know, 20, 30% calories from animals, that's a low carb paleo diet, basically. So yeah. hyper carnivore is compatible with an omnivorous eating pattern. And this is scientists are not very clear in how they make definitions, but I think hopefully this helps clear up confusion. Now, the reason we're hyper carnivores is because meat is essential for us in the technical sense, meaning if we don't eat meat, we will have deficiencies, we will be sick. If infants aren't fed, uh, for example, infants actually are fed 100% carnivore diet when they're breastfeeding. It yeah. is animals, yeah. calories coming from animals, right? At the very basic level. So this is the natural 
way that humans develop brains. They develop it on a carnivore diet from their mother. And then when they grow older, you know, they can vary their diet more. They can include more plants. They, they're, they're more adaptable. But the carnivore diet is key to our species. And we have many pieces of evidence for this. So if you want, I can go through, you know, a, a short list and you can stop me at uh, yeah, any please, moment please. if you have a question. Yeah, please. So we already talked about the energetic returns that you get from hunting animals versus gathering plants. And that's about 10 times more with animals and plants. So from yeah. the advantage perspective of our species, it's very clear. If you can hunt animals, you should hunt them, basically. Yeah. So this and, that's, and, that's um, yeah. uh, and that's why herbivores and that's why herbivores keep uh, chewing all day long, just because they right, don't have exactly. enough energy to, to extract from that. Right. Right. We can even see the difference between a wolf and a cow. The wolf hunts and rests most of the time and plays and then then yeah. goes hunting. A cow has a different strategy. And, you know, one is a carnivore and the other is a herbivore. So we fit more, we're actually more carnivorous than wolves, uh, if you look at the stable isotope data. So this is one very important line of evidence. There is something called a nitrogen-15 stable isotope. Uh, and this is uh, a form of nitrogen that we can look at in human fossil collagen. So fossils from humans that uh, still have collagen in it, collagen residues, if they're you know, around 50,000 years old. We can use this technique to look at where the nitrogen comes from. Does it come more from plants or more from animals? And when we look at the ratios of certain of these isotopes, which are forms of nitrogen, we can put you, you know, more or less close to carnivore or herbivore or that sort of thing, or even uh, protein coming from the sea versus protein coming from the land. You can do it with carbon, you can do it with different atoms. When you look at this whole area of study, it's very clear. Humans are as carnivorous of wolves, if not even more. And I think even vegetarians would admit that wolves are carnivores. So if we are, you know, at least as carnivorous as them, clearly we're made to eat a lot of uh, animals. So I think that's a really important piece. Then we have also the very high percentage of body fats. If you look at a human okay. versus a chimpanzee or other primates, they're extremely lean, you know, 2% fat or something. A very lean human who looks, you know, very good at the gym, a man, is going to have maybe 9%, 10% fat. So like yeah. way more than the normal chimp. So humans have very high amount of fat because our metabolism really relies on fat. Fundamentally, it's a fat burning metabolism. Yes, we can use glucose, but even if you're a glucose eater, you're still burning a lot of fat, right? Yeah. So that's, that's one thing. Then we also have a genetic evidence. For example, when we look at the genome, there are areas which are shut down, meaning they're like chromatin clamps, right? They, they, they shut the genome down so they can't be read and expressed. And the regions that are shut down show that this is because we want to increase sort of the fat metabolism genes. And in chimpanzees, who are more reliant on fruit, we see that they want to open the genes for, you know, sugar metabolism, which is makes total sense for their diets. So we have a genetic level of evidence there. Then we have another really important part back to your point about anatomy, stomach pH. So the pH of the yeah. stomach, how acidic the stomach is. I mean, humans are incredibly um, acidic. Their stomachs are around 1.5 to 1.7 median pH which is as acidic as a vulture. So really, really acidic. Like scavengers, we can eat fermented foods, foods with a lot of bacteria. We have uh, you know, many traditions, right, to eat fermented foods. Yeah. This is because the, the pH protects our stomach from the bacteria. So this is what you need if you're a carnivore because you will be eating animals, they will have bacteria. Uh, it's not like just eating uh, fruits in a, in a tree. So there's a different uh, need for stomach pH. So this, we're this on the same pH, level as scavengers. This pH, Rafael, it's uh, it's very hard to keep a, a, a low pH like that. So it's energetically demanding, and uh, I think that Correct. we we won't uh, be able to digest protein, pro, uh, animal protein, if we have a, a pH mm -hmm. much higher than that. That we can see in, in cows and uh, uh, horses that are pH about six seven, and uh, mm -hmm. this 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 low pH it means that uh, uh, that means that we 
begin to 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 eat animals in the in a rotten way or in a, the the leftovers of uh, another carnivores when we were let's say less evolved mm -hmm. right yeah we we could scavenge uh before we were good at hunting we would scavenge what the lion had killed and he had left some pieces they had started to rot there were some flies but we we're hungry we needed to go we went we ate it and we could survive because we had acid in our stomach and as you said it's a very expensive uh, production it takes a lot of energy and you're only going to do this if you're going to have a return on your investment and that's what hunting scavenging we would break open the bone marrow you know the, a lot of fat we would break open the skull with a rock we would break it we would get access to the brains and we could do this because the animals like the lions weren't smart enough so for us it was a good investment to have uh you know a high ph but for the baboon it maybe doesn't make as much sense because what why would they need to invest that yeah yeah great yeah, absolutely um that, should i continue or do you want to yeah please 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 question? there's also the low physiological insulin sensitivity so i'm going to explain what this means <clears throat> we talk a lot about metabolic syndrome and all of these things and one of the key aspects of a lot of modern diseases nowadays, the diseases of civilization, is that people are insulin resistant, the, the, the bad type of insulin resistance, the pathological one. This is when your, your muscles, your, your brain or whatever tissue wants to have access to glucose and fatty acids and fails to gain access to it because insulin is supposed to bring in supposed to bring energy into cells and when the cell resists this the cell can't get the energy so you are what we call insulin resistant this means you're diabetic in a very simplified uh, way so humans uh there's also the normal physic uh, f uh insulin resistance which is what you get when you're pregnant so women often develop insulin resistance during pregnancy and we call this gestational diabetes we call it a disease but it's not really a disease it's just their body resisting insulin at the muscles so that the glucose they produce can go to the baby and to the mother's brain. So yeah. there's a pathological kind, which is diabetes, and then there is the physiological kind, which is just a mechanism how humans evolve. And carnivores tend to be physiologically insulin resistant. So this is another aspect where we are similar to, you know, you know other carnivores like lions and, and things like that. So that's one, uh, one aspect. Uh, we also, like we mentioned before, very overall smaller gut anatomy so we have very long small intestines and very short large intestines because we the long the small intestine is where you you absorb like the meat the protein the sugar and the large intestines is where you would ferment more let's say uh, in a sense so we have shortened the part we don't use as much our colon also is quite short small fermentative capacity but a longer small intestines uh, you also mentioned our teeth our our jaw Actually, our jaw is much smaller than most uh, uh, most other animals. It reduced when we were, you know, more like Australopithecus that we were talking about, you know, mm -hmm. many millions of years ago. We had a much bigger jaw, much wider teeth that could really grind a lot of hard, you know, nuts, plants, tubers, uh, that sort of thing. Now we have a much smaller uh, jaw. It's not as powerful because we have the technology to cook our animals and our plants, and so our our jaw and teeth have adapted to that. Uh, so that's, you know, one other uh, example. Uh, there's a really cool one. We have a shoulder that's actually made for throwing. Uh, yeah. If you look at other animals, other apes, they don't really have this anatomy to throw well. Humans can throw extremely well, precisely from far. Uh, and you're doing this if you hunt. You're not throwing like this to catch a fruit in the tree, right? You're, yeah. you're doing yeah. this to, to take yeah. down an elephant. And that's a huge, huge anatomical change for, for hunting. Um, the, our fat cells, if you look at our number of fat cells, we have many small insulin sensitive fat cells. So we have four times more fat cells per unit weight than other primates. So the primates, they don't need fat tissue, you know, to fast, for example. Uh, they don't need it because they're eating all the time. They're eating the trees, the fruits, the, the tubers. We have fat cells that really say, yes, these species need to fast and they need to, you know, be able to absorb the fat and be insulin sensitive to it. Um, we're, we're, we live long, right? Um, yeah. much longer than many other chimps, uh, 
uh, species. And one reason, one speculated reason, it's because it takes time to become a good hunter. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, in tribes, they, the experience peaks around age 40. 40 years old is probably when they're very strong physically and have a lot of experience. And you're not going to you know, get there if you're only a very like a dog where you live 15, 20 years. You're not going to have the hunting experience uh, necessary. So that's one other uh, aspect. Um, let's see, dental caries. When you go to the dentist because mm-hmm. you have a carry, that didn't exist uh, more than 15,000 years ago. Those appeared in the you know, human uh, remains record about 15,000 years ago. So again, we know why people get caries. I think this is probably one of the most accepted facts in medicine. Sugar gives you caries. So yeah. this is not something, you know, we have been consuming in large amounts continuously throughout the year, um, you know, uh, uh, like that. So the, the teeth tell us a lot. And, and lastly, it's not anatomy, but it's actually a behavioral aspect. And carnivores uh, have a lot of social flexibility. They divide labor. They share food. And they alloparent, meaning that they don't just take care of their children. They tend to take care of the children of their cousin or aunt or, you know, they Mm. take care of other children. So these are all overlaps behaviorally that also suggest we are carnivores. So it's not just the anatomy. It's also the, you know, hunting uh, and and the behavior. Um, So there are many, many, many reasons why we are carnivores. You know, this is why I think... It's, I like to tell this, and I'm glad you're asking me the questions, because this is not usually discussed in nutrition conversations. But yeah, I think yeah. it's, it's the real science about how you decide, you know? Yeah. And the, the, the things you said about uh, fasting, I, I think this is, what, this is one of the, the main reasons that we have the, the health crisis that we are in today. Because uh, we are made too fast you, you, uh, we have the this, uh, the small cells many small cells adipose cells and uh, uh, at this at this time of the, the the our evolution we are not fasting at all uh, I think the the, the uh, average human are eating about 12 to 16 hours a day. It only it only stop eating when they when, when we are asleep, and even there, there there's some there's some some people that uh, wake up in the in the midnight to to make a a, a snack. Then yeah. uh, uh, it's it's a uh, it's it's very interesting that you say that because uh, recently we have a, 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 an article in the American Heart Association blog. I, I think you have have read it that says that fasting increased oh, right. 91% the chance of cardiac death né? and CVD, right, right. Uh, cardiac disease. Yeah. And uh, 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 it, it's interesting that the, the, the medical profession and the nutrition profession don't even know about that, right. you are saying. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really like waking up from a bad dream, but you're still in the bad dream. You're still yeah. in a nightmare uh, because it's like having, uh, you know, physicists who don't really understand that the earth is going around the sun. In medicine, yeah. nutrition, people don't understand that what we ate in the past strongly informs how we should be eating today. And as yeah. long as this fact isn't appreciated, taught in medical school, taught to nutritionists, we're going to be stuck doing the same mistakes again and again and again. And this is why it's not a sexy idea to talk about evolution, but it's also what's needed to get a meaningful conversation. So saying that you're going to increase your risk of death because you fast in a species who's exquisitely adapted to fasting because we can produce ketones amazingly easily. Infants, when they're born and breastfeeding, they produce ketones. And they produce ketones on a diet that's 40% lactose, so 40% carbs they're still producing ketones. You can measure this in a baby who's, you know, don't believe me, you can measure it in a baby. It's very easy to, to check. You know? Yeah, I'll, I'll, um, be doing yeah. The, I'll be doing this yeah. if my wife let me because yeah. she's pregnant right now. Oh, <laughs> I don't think she's gonna let me do this. <laughs> yeah, my wife didn't, so uh, I'll, I'll let some other father confirm. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, 
Yeah, like even compared to dogs, dogs, uh, you know, they can, a dog can, doesn't have to eat every day. He can skip a day, but he's not going to go into ketosis. Humans, we skip, you know, one day, half a day, we go into ketosis so easily. We're really, uh, really strong fat burners. And we're also endurance animals. Uh, we probably persistence hunted, meaning we're not fast. But if we keep running behind the prey for hours, we can uh, exhaust them and they will fall because they cannot sweat and cool their body temperature. And we can sweat and we can run and we can do this all day. I mean, marathoners show this, trail runners yeah. show this, yeah. tribes show this, uh, even a horse. Uh, humans can outrun a horse uh, long distance, which is you know incredible. Uh, yeah. So clearly you need a fat-based metabolism to do that. You cannot be reliant on a portable source of glucose with you. So yeah. there are so many lines of evidence for this. Yeah. And that that's interesting because uh, 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 today we have this this I call I call vegan agenda. I think we can call that. And uh, it's it's like it's like a, a, a going backwards yeah. from what we should eat eating and uh, it's 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 like a, an ideology because it doesn't is it doesn't have a, a solid science to back them but uh we see uh, uh, uh they are advancing and uh, the the people are are saying that and you have this in nutrition that a vegan diet is more healthy than uh, than a, a diet that includes meat uh but What's your opinion about this? What's your opinion about veganism? Is it sustainable? Is it is it possible to be a vegan without some supplements? Uh, uh, because some some people say to me, but uh, can uh, and that shows the the that the evolution knowledge is it's a it's a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, complex and mistaken the the people of the the lay people uh uh but can't we adapt to be vegan mm -hmm. yeah so what can you tell about this so this is actually a really important point because uh oftentimes people say look uh, humans adapt you know over a couple thousands of years and they always give the same example they say look we have la we can digest lactose right they say yeah. the lactase persistence so this is where you need to understand a little bit of molecular biology to understand why it's not a good example. So lactase persistence evolved over, you know, about, what was it, at, um, in the last five, 10,000 years, around there. So a relatively short amount of time from the point of view of a species. Now, the adaptation is what we call a simple genetic adaptation or, or mutation. So we have the mechanism to digest milk, right? All babies digest the mother's milk. So we know, we all agree, we have this mechanism. The, the ability to keep digesting it during adulthood is simply not letting it turn off. So the genes that are working to give you the, the lactase uh, enzyme to digest milk, rather than shut off, we adapt it to keep it on. That's all it is, extremely simple. It can happen over a short period of time. Now, adapting to a vegan diet, meaning to a low fiber, uh, high fiber, low calorie density, low nutrient density, low quality diet, that re requires a huge amount of adaptation. That requires changing the gut anatomy, changing the teeth, changing the behavior, this time you spend, you know, it's like everything changes. You're a completely different species. So vegan diet, adapting to a vegan diet is totally n different than adapting uh, to keep an adaptation that already exists. You know, it's not yeah. even comparable. So yeah. the vegan diet, we cannot adapt to it over a short amount of time. It would take hundreds of thousands of, of years to, to adapt to it um, by the normal process of, of evolution. And really, veganism, I think, is a unhealthy diet at any age, but it's specifically for infants. So. When we talk about healthy diets, people tend to assume we're talking about adults because adults are the people who choose how they eat, right? Yeah. But of course, they have to choose for, par uh, for their children. So there's, it's also important to judge a diet along the whole spectrum of life, not just on one moment in life. So when we judge by the whole spectrum in life, no infant can survive a pure vegan diet. Infants have died on vegan diets, and there is a law 
in Italy, in Belgium, uh, I think also in um, another European country, that if parents put infants on vegan diets, they can go to jail because it's considered uh, human abuse to not properly nourish an infant. And I think that's very reasonable and very strong scientific basis for saying it should be illegal for infants. Now, once you are an adult and you can make your own decisions, I would not recommend you go on a vegan diet for many, many reasons, but of course you're free to, to do it. Um, and the problem is this, you won't have enough B12, you won't have a good amino acid profile, you won't have omega-3 DHA, you won't have uh, ketones present because your diet is 99% likely to be high carb, although it is technically possible to be uh, keto on vegan, but extremely very, rare, extremely very, complicated. Yes. And very hard to do it. Very, very hard. So it's really the exception that proves the rule. Um, yeah. Of course, you will suffer gastric issues, probably other allergy, inflammation, autoimmune issues. But it's possible that coming off a terrible junk food industrial diet, yeah. for a while, you may feel better. That's true. That's, that's possible. It happens. Um, so generally, so we work, so if you come to our medical clinic, uh, we will work with vegans and vegetarians, but we will never uh, let give you the impression that it's healthy. We will tell you the truth and then we will help you make it, you know, less bad as possible. But we will encourage you to consider a higher quality diet for, for your health and for your, your mental health. So if you're a vegan vegetarian, you want to come work with us, please do. And if you want to challenge us, please do. We encourage all our <laughs> patients to challenge us, send us papers, share videos. We're very open to discussing because these are hard, complex issues. And we all came from a place of ignorance at some point. So it's totally yeah. fine. Um, so, yeah, I don't think it's a it's a good diet uh, to to have really at, at any age. Yeah. And uh, uh... We have we have here in Brazil uh, a nutritionist that is vegan, and uh, he is very 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 uh, it's, it's a very influencing person, mm -hmm. and uh, he's keeping going on podcasts and things like that. And recently, I saw a video that he says that humans are not meant to eat too much proteins, and uh, he says that. The human breast milk only have 6% protein. And that's a reason that human, if, if babies that are growing don't need protein, uh, adults don't need protein too. That, that's his, his, yeah. his argument. What do you think about that? It's a very clever argument. I have to give him credit because I can see why this is very convincing to people. Mm -hmm. And a lot of vegan influencers, uh, they may be wrong, but they're not necessarily stupid. So we have to yeah. give him credit <laughs> yeah. for that. Um, and him, and so in this case, it is true. Breast milk has about seven, six to eight percent protein, depending on the stage, because the amount of protein changes throughout the first months. So first you have colostrum in the first days when the baby yeah. is born. Then you have the called the first milk, uh, and then you have the mature milk, uh, and even the milk when the baby is feeding at the beginning and 20 minutes later is different. The first milk is actually lower in fat and higher in other nutrients. And then after 20 minutes or something of breastfeeding, it's higher fat. So depending when you measure the time of life, it's very different. So it's not so easy to generalize, but in general, yes, it's relatively low protein compared to the amount that we need as adults. And I think there are probably multiple reasons for this, but the first one is that it's not that protein is bad, it's that fat is really important. And so yeah. you want the diet to be high in energy. You want it in lactose and carbs, and you want it high in fat. And you keep protein to whatever the body needs at minimum, but it's not beneficial to go higher protein. So that's the first thing. Second of all, a uh, baby is what? It's, it's very fat and it has a big head, right? So it's, it's a uh, high body fat, high uh, percentage of, uh, you know, cholesterol in the brain, all of this. So you don't really need protein for this at that stage. That's not what you're sustaining. Once you're an adult, right? Your head is smaller compared to your body. And now your body has much more muscle mass. So your needs for protein are going to adapt now that you're an adult. 
So this is very easily explained by looking at the developmental phases in life. Yeah. And I think it's a very intuitive concept that these things change uh, depending on your phase, right? So everyone understands that you cannot feed uh, a baby a salad when they are three months old because we know their digestive system is not adapted. And so it's the same things for these other aspects of micronutrients. Once the baby is you know, away from the mother, the immune system has been formed by all the immune factors the mother has given them. So they're more able to interact with the outside world, with different foods, with different bacteria. So this is always changing and adapting. And I think this vegan argument is trying to tell us to forget these complexities, to give us a simple argument. And this is rarely, rarely correct, of course. Yeah. And uh, uh, we, we can see that uh, in... We see older men, elderly, that we have uh, sarcopenia, that is a, a loss of muscle. And we see this sarcopenia going uh, forward in a, very, in, a, in, a, in a very rapid way if you don't have the, 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 if you don't have the, the adequate diet. And especially if you don't have the adequate diet and the, the physical activity. So, but... Uh, uh, some 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 people that have uh, dysphagia that it's the problem to to eat to chew né? some elderly that uh, have mm -hmm. uh, sm uh, smaller teeth so don't have all the teeth mm -hmm. and we have to put them in protein supplements so they cannot lose muscle mass so mm -hmm. uh, compare compare a baby to a, a grown man it's a, it's a clever argument because yeah. every everyone says that the the, the breast milk the, the mother milk is the, the best uh, uh, food right. for our species everybody says that but yeah. it's the best food for the for us but in a certain period of life not in every right. no, there, there's no way we can we can sustain a, a, an adult with breast milk Yeah, and also you should ask the influencer if uh, the diet generates ketones, shouldn't your vegan diet be ketogenic then? By the same standard, right? If, yeah, uh, that's, if a, good, that's a great good, question. High, coating, high fat, high protein, um, yeah, high ketones is going to be good as well, right? So. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a great. Uh, I, I think he'll eat, he'll eat avocados for the rest of his life. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 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 some, some, some people say... Rafael, that uh, the opposite of veganism is a carnivore diet. What do you think about the carnivore diet? Is it a diet that we can rely on? Or is it just another fad? Or is it sustainable? It, it, it is possible. Is it possible to get all the nutrients from a carnivore diet? Mm -hmm. So I, um, I used to think that we needed a certain amount of plants and especially fiber. In fact, I have Twitter messages from seven, eight years ago where I'm discussing these things with friends saying, you know, low carb is fine because you can still have plants and all the fiber and it's healthy. So I definitely was from the mainstream view uh, before. Then I you know, read a lot, talked to people who have been using it therapeutically, started reading the research that is on it, even the historical records that date back hundreds, even thousands of years on, on this diet being used. Um, and I think carnivore is the opposite of vegan in terms of like plants to animal ratio. So in the simple sense, yes, it's the opposite, but it's not equivalent, meaning that it's not the other extreme that's also bad it's actually the other extreme that's perfectly natural and we're well adapted to it now that doesn't mean it's the optimal diet i actually don't know what the optimal diet is i don't know if it's 100 animals 70 animals 80 i don't know it's uh, very hard to answer and probably different answers for different people at different times but in general the carnivore diet is a perfectly good option for people to consider Uh, it's very easy in terms of time. It's time saving uh, compared to yeah. a diet where you cook a lot and you, you know, the vegetables go bad. And, you know, there's many simple aspects. It's also a bit more complicated socially, of course, when you can't, yeah. you know, have the pasta, the bread, the cake, all of these things. So there is good aspects to it and bad aspects to it. But I would say the bad aspects are mostly social or even uh, cost. If you can only afford, if you can only have access to expensive meat. 
But if you plan, if you budget, normally, like, I'm going to focus on eggs, ground beef, butter, these things are not that expensive, and you can have a very high-quality diet for not expensive at all. So it really depends how you approach it. And then from the health aspect, I mean, from the health aspect, it's helped so many people gain health that they could not have gained otherwise. And people with very serious mental disorders like bipolar, people with very serious autoimmune issues who have had joints replaced because of their arthritis or their asthma. Um, So lots of different uh, autoimmune conditions. And of course, diabetics and people who are obese. A lot of people have have used these strategies. And uh, very interestingly, uh, anorexics. So although the carnivore is now known for weight loss, Actually, anorexic people who are extremely, uh, you know, close to to dying because they're so uh, lean and and low fat, um, they have been using it because it helps regulate appetite. It helps uh, fight food addictions. And this is really interesting because maybe it's the low carb, but sometimes low carb is not enough for everyone. And sometimes carnivore takes them this bit further so that they can free themselves of addiction. And it's very interesting because we don't know what's going on here. It's totally new. This is cutting edge. And I think it's really exciting time because now it's not just 10 anecdotes. It's tens of thousands of anecdotes, some observational data. We're having the first clinical trials that are already underway. Uh, We had a ketogenic diet for bipolar just come out. We have a carnivore diet study that's ongoing. So in the next few years, we're really going to be able to, yeah, I think Sean Baker has helped uh, make, make that happen. I think it's ongoing. So we will have now some real uh, evidence behind it as well. And I think it's going to be very, very interesting because it will, uh, you will see it attacked immensely in the media. And yeah. that's a good sign yeah. that uh, it's having an interesting uh, impact yeah. on people. Yeah. You, said, you said one thing that's very interesting that uh, we, we don't have uh, a specific one diet for, uh, uh, to paraphrase, uh, Lord of the Rings, one diet to do to rule them all. Yeah, you don't. Ha- we don't have one diet because we have. We are the the. Uh, I think the the species that uh, col- colonized all the planets. We have mm-hmm. we have human beings in Arctic situations. We have human beings in tropical situations, and we can have one diet that serves for a person that is in the tropical and in the in the, the article we we got if you analyze i i know that's not the the best thing to the, be, the best thing to 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 summarize a diet but if you analyze a a, a hadza uh, that lives in the equatorial in tanzania and we take a inuit diet we have uh, uh, it, it's obvious that we have we have to have some difference. The Inuit right, don't right. have to don't 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 be a, is not able to plant anything. Mm-hmm. He will survive in meat from uh, uh, seal, whale, and some ground mammals, mammals of a right. baby. But uh, if we have uh, a Hadza, we have a. Uh, 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 animals that are leaner, animals that are smaller, and we have to to survive a little more on tubers, maybe on honey. So uh, uh, our evolution and our spread through the all the biomes in, in, in the earth made us omnivores because the the environment was uh, was a, a great pressure for our. Hour. But uh, uh, as, my, as I, I study about this, Rafael, I saw that even in uh, populations that use, usually eat a lot of plants, animal foods are praised. Exactly. And uh, yeah. I, 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 there is a, 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 a population, a civilization, an ancient civilization that even save some foods for higher uh, higher gra- uh, higher level uh, people in their in their tribes like the liver the liver uh, uh, is just for the elderly that uh, have this right 
So I think that we can say uh, beyond no doubts that animals are important for our health. And uh, actually, you know, it's funny because plants are too, but personally, I think they have a more important role as medicines than as food. I mean, they also have a role as food because they're the food of our food, of the animals that are eating them. So they're important for us. And it's really, you know, the, the people tend to see things always as a, a combative, you know, or, or yeah. opposed. But in this sense, it's, I don't think it's the right way to conceptualize it because Yes, humans are hyper carnivores for all the reasons we said, but it's beautiful and amazing and very enriching to understand that we're extremely well adapted to consuming, like you said, diets from all over the world. I mean, we're really unique, I think, in this in this way. There are very few animals that have as varied a diet as, as humans can, especially because humans can cook. So they can really yeah. make it even more varied and take things that are totally toxic and make them not bad or even good, and that's incredible, right? It's a testament that we're a very unique species and our diet is complex. So this is why this vegan versus carnivores, it's missing the point. It's yes, we're hyper carnivores, but there's incredible variety. And I think that the more sick you are, the less you're able to handle the millions of chemicals that are in plants that they use mm. as defenses. So this is, this is not because plants are bad, it's just because you're adapted to handle a certain amount at different phases in your life, right? It's, it's normal. Even if you go kill an animal, the stomach contents were sometimes consumed by the, by the people. And this had, you know, plants matter, a bit of a, a fecal matter. I mean, it's, it's a mess of things and humans can handle this to some extent. When you're sick in the modern world where people are weak and have all sorts of diseases, Maybe it's not possible to enjoy as much variety as we once were able to. And that's a, it's a pity, but it's just a fact. We have to adapt to it to take care of our health. And we should not take the decision ideologically. We should be open to the type of diet that's going to really enable us to live a quality life. Yeah, yeah, uh, I agree with you. Uh, if you can uh, uh, shift gears just a little bit, and could, could you talk a little bit more about your PhD projects and uh, the keto diet and uh, the, 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 the mental health? Uh, I am asking this because uh, I, had, I recently read the, the Christopher Palmer book, Brain Energy. Yes. It's a great book. And uh, uh, my wife is a psychiatrist. It's, it's getting graduating in psychiatry. And uh, uh, I have some patients that I'm trying to, to, to introduce in a keto diet for that matter. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so at the time when I started my PhD in 2018, I was at uh, Universidad do Minho in, in Braga, in northern Portugal. And I was part of um, uh, ESR, so early stage researcher. And these were projects that were sort of prepared. They already had the topic ready. So I was looking for um, a program and I came across this uh, program, which was uh, looking at the metabolic side effects of antipsychotics in a rodent model of schizophrenia. So this in theory had nothing to do with keto of course i was hugely interested in it so i managed to get uh the keto diet into some of the rats to see how they would uh how they would react so that was the goal of the of the study now i would love to say so much more about it but unfortunately i never got to publish the results and some of the data i couldn't finalize so i have some i have the data on the weight i have some of the data on the behavior um, but some of the data in, of the blood, but it's not a complete picture. But essentially, I can talk to you about the, the general concepts behind yeah. ketogenic diet and, and schizophrenia. So schizophrenia and bipolar, they're very uh, uh, stable in populations, meaning they're around 1%, 1.5% uh, in many different countries all over the world. So it's interesting because a lot of diseases like diabetes, obesity, they've gotten... So common, right? They've skyrocketed. So why hasn't schizophrenia and bipolar skyrocketed? Is it because of genetic? We don't know, right? So it's an interesting, interesting question. And when you try to understand what's the difference between the brain of someone with schizophrenia or bipolar and uh, you know a person who doesn't have these problems, 
it's hard to distinguish them. So you have some things like they have a bit of less brain matter in certain areas. Um, you know, they may have different levels of GABA and glutamate, the excitatory and calming neurotransmitters. So we can look at these differences, but we're not exactly sure. One of the differences I found that I think explains why uh, Christopher Palmer saw these patients of his with like 20 years of a terrible mental disorder get better very quickly on the ketogenic diet. I think it's because it changed the energy state of the brain. What is mm. the energy state? The energy state, there's a, one way to think of it. It's the redox state. So reduction oxidation, the sh it's shortened to the redox state. And this is basically like the charge, like the charge of a battery. The processes in your everywhere, not just in your brain, but everywhere in your body is oxidation reduction, oxidation reduction. That's how you get yeah. metabolism, energy, everything. And the redox state in the schizophrenic bipolar brain is very imbalanced. It's very high in NADH and low in NAD+. And this is a sign of an energy crisis um, that shouldn't be the case in, in the brain. And in part, they have, it's maybe not insulin resistance of the brain, like in Alzheimer's, but it's something similar where the energy is not stable. And this means that the neurotransmitters that require a stable metabolism get produced in the wrong amounts and the wrong signals get sent to the brain. So people can hallucinate, people can get paranoid. The brain is dysfunctional basically. And when the energy source is not stable, then dysfunction happens. So I think this is the very basic simplified theory behind Christopher Palmer's book, Brain Energy Metabolism. And actually he was very kind. He advised me in 2018, 2019 on the PhD, how I should you know, consider to conduct the experiment. So he was very helpful uh, to me personally. Um, and his anecdotes were so intriguing that I had to you know, have a keto arm in the, in the experiment to try and see what, uh, what happened. So, I don't know for sure if the ketogenic diet uh, helped those rats, you know, because I didn't get to finish the full analysis. But uh, it was it was curious that that a lot of the benefits that people are getting by fasting or doing ket uh, ketogenic diet when they're uh, uh, schizophrenic, you know, also fixes a lot of other things. You know, it fixes addiction issues. Um, it fixes their metabolism, which is the opposite of a lot of the antipsychotics. The antipsychotics, it's debatable if they work. It's really, really debatable. It's not clear. Some patients seem to have improvement. Others, really no improvement. But what they all have is side effects. And it's hard to think that they're very useful if the side effects they are doing are going to cause dysfunction in the brain because of unstable energy. Yeah. So... I think it's much more promising to look at ketone supplements, fasting, ketogenic diets, and other uh, medications or interventions, even sleep-related interventions, can, in can stabilize brain energy levels or stress reduction interventions. Anything that's going to help brain metabolism is very strongly likely going to help uh, these patients, and also depressed patients, anxious patients, but even the very serious schizophrenics and, and bipolar disorders. That's very interesting, very interesting indeed. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, Raphael, I don't want to be dis disrespectful with your time, and, but no, uh, there are two, two questions that I always ask my, my, my guests here. One is, what are your health and longevity strategies do, do you use in your daily life? I know you are a crossfitter, and uh, what more? How is your how is your sleep? Your your uh, diet? Uh, tell a little bit about this. Yeah. So my diet is largely a result of uh, a condition that uh, I developed when I was around 25 years old. I developed ulcerative colitis. So for people who don't know, it's when your colon is inflamed, so you don't really digest uh, fiber very well. Uh, you have digestive uh, problems, uh, you know, it's, you're sort of limited in what you can eat without having symptoms. So uh, the way I found to manage this, I don't take medication, but I eat a mostly carnivore diet. So I would say 95% carnivore on the average day. So mostly meat, fish, cheese, cream, eggs, uh, some liver, sometimes, you know, some, some things like that. And and, you know, rarely I'll have, uh, well, actually not rarely, but I'll have some honey, 
Uh, sometimes I'll have some sugar, um, but small amounts. So I'm mostly carnivore. Um, like you said, I cross it a lot. Uh, I do trail running. I love being outside, do some swimming. Uh, I do uh, ice baths, so I love cold exposure. Uh, it's a uh, really a favorite thing of mine. I think just for the mental health benefits, I would, you know, always, uh, keep doing that. That's very powerful. I do also a uh, breath work, uh, Wim Hof breath work, mm. which, uh, it's called hypocapnic hyperventilation. And this, you know, allows you to take control of your autonomous nervous system. So you can start getting warm. You uh, have basically release a lot of adrenaline. So it's very anti-inflammatory. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's very energizing. And this is also a good de-stressing uh, technique for breathing. Uh, then sleep. I'm very uh, particular about my sleep. You know, bedtime for me is 10, 11, really at the latest. Uh, usually I get up, you know, around, around 6, uh, 6 a.m. So I'm very consistent. I'm a good sleeper. Um, and yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. I spend as much as uh, time I can outside and, uh, connect a lot with, uh, friends, family and, and acquaintances, uh, where we share common interests. And this makes yeah. it very, very fulfilling, very fun for me. Great. Great. And, uh, the other question is I always ask, uh, for a book recommendation. One that uh, mm -hmm. impacted your life, uh, regardless of the subject, it could be on mm -hmm. any subject. Do you have any any jewel, any jewel for us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually have two authors. Um, so one impacted me very directly. That's Gary Taubes. He's a science yeah. journalist, uh, very famous now in the low carb keto world. So good calories, bad calories. But he also wrote Why We Get Fat, The Case Against Sugar. The case for keto and the latest book, Rethinking Diabetes, that uh, yeah. I still have to read. Actually, I haven't read that one. So any of his books by Gary Taubes is, is great. And then there's also Nick Lane. He's uh, Nick Lane. basically he's the guy who studies the origins of life. So yeah. from a chemistry by yeah. biochemistry perspective, so you you know him, um, yeah. and he's great. He wrote a book on oxygen, on mitochondria, on evolution, on the question, you know, what is life and the chemistry of, of life and death. So all of his books, especially the mitochondria one, I think it's for yeah, the power, the sex and suicide. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. I have this one. I have this one. It's a, it's an absolutely great book. Oh, nice. Fantastic. Yeah. So any any of the of the books from these two authors, Gary Taubes and Nick Lane, uh, they're fantastic. Great. And when is it uh, that is uh, your book coming out? Are you <laughs> are you writing some? <laughs> I haven't thought of a book, but uh, maybe one day, maybe one day you put the idea in my head and it will grow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, my friend, thank you very much for accepting the invitation. Thank you very much for being here. It was a great talk and uh, I hope we, we, we meet in the future in person. Uh, who knows? And uh, in a convention or when I go in France, I, mm -hmm. uh, I really Really loved our conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Enrique. It was a pleasure. It was very, very cool for me to talk to you. And congratulations on everything you're doing and all the good advice you're putting out there. So please do it. Uh, I work with a Brazilian girl who, who would be very happy that you're helping Brazil uh, get out of the junk food problem like so many other countries have. So anything I can do to help, but please just ask. And yeah, I hope we meet at a conference soon. Uh, Thank that'd you. Be great. Uh, that'd be great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.